consider supporting this podcast on Patreon. On this episode of the What is Asia podcast, I have the privilege of interviewing Klaus Mielhan, a professor of Chinese history at Zeppelin University, to talk about his book, Making China Modern, From the Great Qing to Xi Jinping. Dr. Mulhan, thanks for coming on this episode of the What is Asia podcast. Hi, glad to be here. So uh, first of all, I just want to say that I love your book. It's uh, around 600 pages, and I can say that I did read it from cover to cover. And one of the reasons that I loved your book so much is because I felt like it was uh, innovative in the way that it looked at Chinese history, you utilize something called institutional theory to frame your discussion of Chinese history. Uh, Can you first of all explain what is institutional theory for the audience? And then why did you think this was the most appropriate way to approach discussing modern China? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. That's a great question. And Um, You know, when we look at these large scale histories of modern China, so histories that cover, let's say, more than 100 years or so, you know, most of these histories of China sort of look for political leaders or for something, you know, like uh, ideological attitudes or even cultural traditions as explanations for the for the development of China's uh, history. So it's either, you know, some some residual Confucianism that sort of, uh, you know, influences China or it's uh, the ideology of communism or it's the the leaders, right? I mean, the, the new emperors. So, and I was always unhappy with that sort of explanation. So I was looking for something else, which, you know, for something that explains the development of a society or of a history. And uh, that's where I came across theories of institutionalization or institutional, um, uh, you know, theory Um, that sort of explain differences between societies and their development, and especially also development outcomes. Now, institutional history means we look at how societies are organized. We look at the rules, you know, of how they work. So, for instance, how do... Um, political authorities and society, um, you know, work together or uh, exchange information and so on and so forth. So institutions are the rules. And I think they are an interesting way, innovative way to understand historical developments. So one aspect of your book that I really appreciate is that it divides chapters, not by uh, dynastic party reign periods, but by timeframes within those periods that are defined by important, irreversible shifts in China's institutions. This book has brought to mind an argument that I've mused over and I've discussed with plenty of people uh, about whether or not it's useful to teach Chinese history in terms of turning points in China's uh, history, as opposed to teaching it as a sequence of dynasties or party reigns since teaching Chinese history through that lens tends to carry the danger of sort of painting generalizing images of those dynasties that slash party reigns. And while I do understand it can be useful if you're teaching like a freshman class Chinese history, I feel like once you get beyond that point, I'm not so sure that it's a useful way of talking about Chinese history. What what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is also a fascinating uh, question. And um, I think... So one of the advantages of an institutional perspective on China is that it actually allows us to understand that certain institutions, you know, continue to exist despite political change or, you know, regime change or despite revolutions and even rebellions, right? So there are institutions uh, that change much slower. So I think um, it, as you said, it's, it's especially important you know to think about Chinese history it's something that is that there is a continuity despite neglecting uh, the enormous changes that are also taking place so it's especially I think an institutional perspective that allows to pin down change in a more precise way. Mm -hmm. So 
I, I guess just to, to drive at the question just a little bit more, I mean, do you think pedagogically speaking, we should be making changes as, as a field in Chinese history? Uh, it changes in what sense? Like in, in the sense that once we move beyond uh, sort of the freshman class, uh, should we be teaching it more as just sort of like turning points? Yeah, absolutely. I think turning points are very important, but these turning points, you know, might not be the political cesura, right, mm -hmm. that we are talking about. So, so the turning points that I would see is perhaps less, for instance, you know, 1911, uh, the end of empire, but possibly, you know, rather, let's say, 19, uh, in the 1920s, when, uh, you know, the construction of a new nation state begins with the establishment of new institutions, complete new government institutions. And so, for instance, also, if you think about the People's Republic of China, it's obvious that 1978 is perhaps uh, a very, very important uh, turning point, which in, you know, perhaps much more important than uh, 1949. So I do think turning points are important. Or let me give an, a last example. I think 1989 is a really important turning point, not only for the democracy movement, but also for the way the Chinese state operates and, and also for its institutional design. Because afterwards, what we can see is, you know, sort of a modification, strengthening of, of, of certain, you know, state uh, institutions, uh, strengthening of capacities and so on. So one discourse that I've noticed that's prominent in other fields, such as Japanese studies, just in my time doing this podcast and interviewing people from all different fields pertaining to Asia. When we look at Japan, for example, uh, uh, one question that they, they muse over quite often is whether or not the Meiji Restoration represents rupture or continuity. However, it seems as though when we talk about important events in Chinese history, such as the Xinhai Revolution of 1911, which ended China's imperial era, uh, China historians seem to take for granted that these historical events represent rupture and less emphasis is therefore placed on continuity. Uh, as I've mentioned before, for example, uh, your book and my assessment is structured around uh, sort of these, these great changes or, or turning points in China's institutions. This format, as a consequence, places a great emphasis on the idea of rupture and change. Uh, and not just talking about your book, but just kind of the, the field of Chinese history in general. Uh, is the general discourse on Chinese history, particular, particularly modern Chinese history, not taking enough of a balanced approach in analyzing Chinese history in terms of rupture and continuity? Yeah. Or maybe there's differences even between the way we teach it in the U.S. and Germany or et cetera. Well, I think that the way we teach it here in Germany is actually quite similar to the way uh, Chinese history is taught uh, in the U.S. Um, and I think, you know, if again, if we look back and look at these uh, classical, you know, uh, general histories of China, you, you most, you know, most of these histories do, of course, you know, um, highlight it's sort of a contradiction, you know, they highlight a sort of a cultural or uh, societal continuity, but while also emphasizing, of course, political change, especially revolutions, you know, so many books actually have the title of, you know, China in revolution, the revolution of China, revolutionary China, and so on. So there's a sort of a cultural conservatism and a political, and the acknowledgement of, of political change. And so, uh, and, and I think, however, you know, my perspective on this was really to, to, to balance, indeed, change and continuity. So institutional theory allows us to understand the long-term development of certain institutions. And in my book, for instance, I highlight examination systems. I highlight certain, you know, institutional basis of government, you know, government planning, infrastructure investment, and so on and so forth. So the, un the very understanding of what a government does and what it is for, you know, is one of the things where I see, despite the changes, the political changes, a lot of continuity. Yeah. So the way, you know, the Chinese government today 
understands of itself and its major projects, it's very similar to the late Qing government, meaning investment in infrastructure, you know, improving in infrastructure, setting the frameworks, you know, for uh, economic uh, development. That's a very Chinese way, you know, of thinking uh, about uh, development. And so I see the continuity, but on the other hand, of course, it's also very clear, you know, that the changes happen due to uh, what I call in the book also contingencies, right? I mean, there are certain things, and that's some, that's what I would say is is something that institutional theory has neglected for a long time, because it does emphasize continuity, but we can see from China that con contingencies and unexpected, you know, unexpected and unplanned events, even global events, you know, can in fact shatter institutions and can force change uh, upon a society. So you're absolutely right. I think for us as historians, this is the major challenge, you know, to balance continuity, but of course do not neglect, you know, uh, uh, change. Yeah. And, and that doesn't even apply only to China, it actually applies to any other history. So uh, one unexpected irony of your book's theme uh, is that it discusses China's gradual transition into a quote-unquote modern nation-state. Uh, and a modern society, at least in one sense, is defined by its status as a member of a globalized society whose domestic environment is conducive to economic growth. However, since your book has been published, uh, China has in some ways receded from that global society. And just to give people context who don't know, your book came out in 2019, right before the global pandemic that uh, we had all experienced shortly after. Furthermore, uh, not only uh, have their erratic localized lockdowns staggered their economic growth, but with the exception of a privileged few, no one is allowed inside China. From this view, your book has had the misfortune of being published just before the pandemic changed a number of China's foreign and domestic dynamics. So I'm curious to know if you were still writing your book now and had the opportunity to write an additional chapter on China during and post pandemic uh, phase, what would you add? Well, of course, I, I, one would add the last uh, two years, but in fact, you know, I, I think in the book, I also highlight that there has always been a dynamic in China between opening and closing to the outside world. I mean, that's obvious, right? It's very obvious that the, in the Lei Qing, you know, uh, before uh, the, uh, you know, before the, the self-strengthening movement, I mean, uh, you know, the China tried to, manage uh, uh, and, and perhaps even narrow, you know, its interactions it had with the world. And then we enter a period, you know, until 1949, where China is, of course, opening up and welcomes all sorts of engagements with uh, outside uh, actors. But after 49, uh, China again starts to really control its foreign interaction. So I don't, so we always see that China you know, it sort of, uh, you know, os uh, oscillates between two extremes, total opening and total closure. So in that sense, not that much has changed. And I would even say, uh, of course, you know, there have always been forces with inside China that were very skeptical about foreign influence. And right now they seem to have the upper hand. But I would argue we will see sooner or later, you know, the pendulum uh, swimming back uh, to a more open China. And um, for a number of reasons, because a lot of people, you know, like to think of themselves as global citizens, even in China, uh, or cosmopolitans, that, but also businesses absolutely need the world market. And I think there's a growing panic in China that being isolated for such a long time will, in fact, you know, hurt uh, the economic uh, pers perspectives or perspectives for a lot of companies. So this sort of leads into the second part of the discussion I wanted to have, which is, uh, as briefly mentioned in the previous question, few foreigners are allowed in China. Uh, needless to say, uh, China's, at least in my view, I'll just speak for myself, senseless and overcautious over approach to responding to their pandemic by way of keeping their borders continuously closed to foreigners has severely harmed the ability for China scholars to conduct meaningful research. Currently, opportunities for Chinese language immersion and archival research are limited mostly to Taiwan, which has uh, sparse scholarship 
opportunities, especially compared to that of mainland China. With that said, uh, and I guess you already answered the question a little bit, but if you can elaborate, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of China studies, the ability for us to access these archives uh, when the borders are open slash closed, the ability to obtain scholarship funding to do research, et cetera? Well, I mean, I think China studies is entering a very difficult period uh, for a number of reasons. And one, as you already mentioned, it's because there are changes within China that even if China opens up, that doesn't mean that uh, the archives will really open. And we have seen more and more restrictions uh, before the pandemic. And I'm not very optimistic that they go away because, I mean, it, China and the Chinese government, you know, uh, has paid more and more emphasis to controlling history, right? And also to write, to controlling the historical narrative. And even within China's, uh, you know, scholars that I know very well, friends of mine, you know, suffer from, uh, from that sort of, uh, you know, government intervention that really also tries to make it difficult to write, you know, so to speak, non-official histories. So that's one reason, uh, I think. And so, and I think even if China continues, uh, opens up, I think these restrictions will remain in place. But I also think that I'm, I'm also pessimistic when it comes to China studies in the West is also because the, the conditions of China research in the West have changed. Uh, now more and more people, you know, there's also a politicization of the China debate in the West. And this is also, this is equally as harmful you know, as uh, restricting access to information in China, because it's sort of uh, this politicization, you know, makes it difficult uh, to ask, uh, you know, the right questions. And because they become all politicized, the, the question you ask becomes a political statement. And so therefore, I think in our, in, in our minds, in our heads, something is happening and it makes it difficult to ask, uh, you know, historical questions uh, that arise out of the historical research, which all becomes dominated by political concerns. That's at least my fear. Mm -hmm. Just to jump off of that briefly, do you think that the field is going to shift much more toward Taiwan studies as a result? It seems like that's already kind of happening because at least as of the time of recording this, the borders are open. People are like, well, you know, my PhD funding is running out with every day that passes by. I might as well switch my topic to Taiwan while I have the chance. I mean, do you, do you see it kind of moving in that direction? I, uh, partly, yes, uh, uh, certainly. You know, again, this has happened in the past. You know, so when China was closed, I mean, Taiwan research became more and more important and Hong Kong studies, but Hong Kong studies have become also, it's uh, the case of Hong Kong is also difficult. But let me say, uh, uh, let me, uh, you know, highlight another aspect. I think it's, it's, it's still needed that we do uh, research on mainland China, also historical research on mainland China. And I think, uh, Today's graduate students have to be more inventive, you know, about using sources. And just think that in the 1960s um, and also 50s, it was impossible for Western scholars to access China. But nonetheless, you know, using existing sources made it possible to come up with uh, very good research. So I think we have to go back to that, you know, and work with the materials that we have. And in fact, if you really think about it, we have much more material than ever, even historical material, because so much is now online. So much has been photocopied, digitalized, and brought uh, to the West. Uh, many Western institutions have, uh, have good and enormous, um, you know, holdings, even archival holdings. And then let's not forget there is uh, numerous historical writings that one can always use, because, uh, such as memoirs, such as, you know, uh, uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, essays, when should Liao, BT, and so on, you know, defunct, and, 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 you know, the, the local gazetteers. So I think there is still a lot. We have been used, we, you know, we, we've gotten used to using the archives in China, but when they are closed, there are still alternatives. And to end off our discussion, I wanted to talk about sort of China in the media and uh, our role as scholars in the media. Uh, so it seems to me that especially 
speaking at least from the U.S. perspective, since Donald Trump's ascension to the presidency in 2016, discussions of China have increased in popular discourse, at least here in the U.S. The popularization of China in political media has seemingly borne a number of armchair experts on China who sort of have all the answers. Many of these armchair experts have perpetuated unreliable sort of titillating stories about China that garner a large audience but have relatively low substance in many cases. As a result, it seems that more so than before, credible scholars are having greater difficulty cutting through the noise and reaching the general public. Um, one thing about your career that I've noticed is that you seem to manage to make something of a presence for yourself in news and media organizations. In your view, have, uh, how can more scholars sort of get past that noise of false experts in conveying reliable information to the public? And I guess just sort of as an addition to that question, sort of what would you say about the state of like these, these armchair experts? No, I totally agree with you. There's, uh, there are now so many, you know, self, uh, uh, self uh, uh, made, uh, you know, experts or China experts. And I think that is very difficult because some of that, as, you, as we already talked, is very politicized. It's very polarized. It's not interested in nuances, but, you know, in a black and white uh, picture. And for me, this is extremely dangerous and risky because whether we like it or not, you know, China is a huge presence in the world. And it's also going to be, you know, very important, you know, to deal with China properly. Um, because if we don't get this relationship right uh, between China and the world, let's say, then it's gonna have really, really grave consequences. Nobody, you know, not, there's not, there are very few aspects of our lives can be shielded, you know, from, uh, from, from the relationship with China. That's why I always saw it as my really obligation or duty, you know, to also try to reach out to a larger audience. But it is very difficult because the media is more interested in the extreme positions than in positions of, you know, of nuance and, and, and making differences and explanations. But um, I try to learn it and you have to learn the language of the media uh, also without, but, but not falling into this black and white, you know, uh, 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 paintings, uh, but rather, you know, try to use the media language, a simple language, uh, but nonetheless to make uh, complex uh, explanations. But it is very difficult. It is, it is difficult and, and then uh, you need in, inroads, so to speak. You need people that you know. But it is it is tough, and it has taken me a very long time, uh, really, you know, to get uh, to get better access uh, to the to the media. Mm -hmm. And I guess just to cap it off, what would your advice be to those people who wanted to be a part of that effort to build that bridge between the scholarly world and the general public? I mean, my you know, my advice is you really have to be proactive uh, because if you wait for media to contact you that will you will have to wait for a long time so i i really wrote you know i wrote to journalists i wrote to uh, journals i wrote to you know the editorial staff and so on i approached them proactively and um, and then you have to be really patient because you get a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, rejections and and so on because they are not they are not even that that open but but sooner or later I think that you know then and then one thing comes to leads to another but you need to have the patience and you need to be proactive and I think it's really important for us we cannot afford to cede you know the interpretation or understanding of China to those you know what you called armchair uh, experts. Uh, so, Dr. Mielheim, before we go, uh, you have a podcast that you'd like to share with my audience. Yes, uh, uh, I, thank you so much. It's a podcast that we record in German, and it's called uh, China Ungeschminkt. In, in English, it would be Ch China Behind the Scenes. And uh, we produce uh, an episode every, every month. And um, so I'd be happy for those who speak German, you know, to uh, listen to it. Dr. Mielhan, it's uh, a real pleasure for 
someone of uh, your stature to come on a small insignificant podcast like mine. So thank you. No, I thank you very much because I think it's, uh, you know, this is not a small podcast. I think, as I said, you know, the topic of China is really very important. So I do welcome, you know, uh, opportunities uh, to talk about and share my, my insights. Thank you. And for those who want to see more content, you can go to the What is Asia podcast YouTube channel or nakodadefonso.com. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you.